I kind of want to know I will see if anybody knows that I will pass these around when we get to that point. But um what if you do have some sorts of kind of photos that are um, that are yeah. digital, but um, we also have really cool. Jeremy took one of those little old Holga cameras and took real film. Um, and it was really awesome. So we got these amazing prints. So I thought I would bring those instead. What is film? <laughs> I know you're too young for that term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But, but Jeremy does have a great story of, of how to find this place. He tried to get this stuff developed. And you know, it's like the one place that will develop film, but of course it's not actually a real place. And you have to you have to call somebody and have a a cell connection to them. You can't just go to a place and give them your film. That's way too old, right? So, yeah. 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 let's start that. Well, we'll see. We may get, yeah, we may give a few more minutes. So, yeah, we want to pass these around and then I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to know when it's yes, 
I just want to make sure. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Before you start. Yeah. Um, Based on a question from these guys, is the annual meeting going to be I failed okay, on I, Zoom? Yeah, only okay. Zoom. I really failed this morning not to make that announcement. So <laughs> I'm making it here. Just imagine that we're in like still in the sanctuary right now. Okay. <laughs> the annual meeting is going to be only via at 12:30 on the 5th of February. Only via Zoom. Uh, we are not going to do a public then. We are going to find a different time to do a public. So it's a day with. Okay, the reason I asked was because that's what it seemed to me on the Friday news. And these guys are doing treats at their church on okay. February 5th. Okay, so they can still do that. They can still do that. That would be great. Um, and most people, if they want to get home, they, they have plenty of time to get home okay. by 12 30. Um, and yeah, good to know there was a great date. I bring that all <laughs> Yes, I am. It's being recorded. I don't know if anybody's joining us now. Yeah. Yeah. Like digital, I think, I think there's amazing things you can get with digital photography that you can get clips. But the film is yeah. it's just kind of cool. And you get certain kinds of shots that I think are different. That like there is a difference between digital and but again, I'm not the smarter for it. All right. Well, we will we'll begin. Um and um uh well again, I'll kind of pull these up. My idea is to do a little bit of book reviews first. Uh, and then a little bit of talking about Alaska, so we can we can pull these out again. Um, but first of all, I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, it's been a really um, great joy to be able to figure out, okay, in this couple month period of time of sabbatical, uh, what do I want to try to share? What's shareable from that? And uh, to be able to talk, you know, that first session talked about. Um, the beginnings of the desert at Christ in the Desert Monastery, and then time at our family lake house, and some of the blessings that happened in the water. So, kind of desert and water start out. Uh, and then, last, the last session that I failed to record um, was um, talking through some of the backpacking trips that I had and songs that kind of went with me during those backpacking trips. Uh, and then I wanted to do a little bit more in terms of saying I did actually do some good reading uh, during sabbatical, and I wanted to share just a few books that I had read, and then talk about this really remarkable once in a lifetime trip that we made to Alaska. And I'll say after Jeremy's accident, we were even more grateful that we had made this trip to Alaska. Um, and so I'll get there, and we can. I'll show them some of these photos again. Um, but anyway, thank you for being here. 
So I wanted to start with what you all know already. I am not a silent person. Um, and I think you all know that. I think I'm a pretty verbal person. And um, I found it funny that of the four books I wanted to talk about to you today, three of them have silent in the title. <laughs> and I thought, this is obviously a theme. This was an important theme for this time of battle. Um, and uh, all four of the books addressed uh, silence in various ways. Uh, and I just was reflecting on this because I was a person that grew up with uh, a lot of words and a lot of music. My my mother and stepfather are both writers and academics, um, people that care a lot, a lot, a lot about words. And so I think I grew up kind of surrounded with um, good reading and lots of words and discussion and talk about how much words matter. And then I have a father who's a musician um, for whom music matters a whole lot and the power of music matters. And I think I learned that too. Watched a lot of concerts, played a lot of music myself and really uh, took that all in. Um, and I realized that when I reached this sabbatical last year, um, at I guess 45 then, I'm 46 now, um, I wanted to spend a little bit more time in the in-between space, in between the words and music, in the silent space. And, um, you know, words and music both only have meaning when you have, when you have the silence in between. And I think that um, maybe this is the case for lots of people as we grow up, uh, we come to appreciate more and more those spaces of quiet and even silence. Um, so, um, so I read a few books uh, that that focused me on this, and I just want to share a little bit about them uh, before I talk about Alaska. Uh, the first one is the only one that I don't have a copy of here, and I mentioned this in one of the first uh, battle sharing forums that I had, but I'm going to say the title to you, and if you actually want the title to write down later, I I would recommend this book. And this was the one social history book that I read, and it was called Silence, a social history of one of the least understood elements of our lives. Um, and uh, this is a relatively recent book written by a woman named Jane Brocks. And I'm going to just read a couple of sentences from a Harvard online review about it. John Bro uh, Jane Brocks's Silence starts with the story of the first prisoner at Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. An 18-year-old man named Charles Williams, who in 1829 was convicted of stealing and sentenced to two years of solitary, silent confinement in the penitentiary. It was hoped there would be an expansiveness in the silence. Writes Brox. Charles William's sentence was meant to punish him for his crime and deter others from committing them, but it was also meant to alter his soul. And um, Jane Brox starts with the history of um, the development of solitary confinement and silence in our prison system in the United States that happened kind of in the late part of the 18th, early 19th century. Um, and she does a remarkable job of talking about how silence has this great history, certainly in religious traditions, in monastic traditions, as a way that we get to know God, the way that we come to a time of prayer that that is like this holy, powerful time where God can reach out to us and we can connect with God. Um, and so there were all of these people who were thinking, how do we punish people in a way that will really reform them? Because back in those days, and if you, know, you read about punishments in early United States in like the 17th and 18th century, there was a lot of public shaming public humiliation, public torture, you know, various varieties of 
you know, everything from putting somebody in the stocks publicly or beating them publicly or dragging them through the streets publicly. There were some great, uh, and some, you know, devices that were put on people. I read this, um, she talks about the, what was known as the skull bridle in the Puritan area era that was basically a metal bit and bridle that often was used on women who were who who were called out in the community as having talked too much or said the wrong thing. And so these women were then put in the bridle in which this this powerfully sharp thing would be against your tongue. So if you tried to speak, you would be blended. So I, I say that only to say there was this history of all of these really awful punishments. And so here there were at kind of the beginning of the 19th century this, this ideal of Americans to say, is there a better way to punish people that isn't just torturing them? Um, what if instead of the crowded prison system where everybody would be thrown into a huge kind of black hole and maybe fed and maybe not and all be communally together, what if we created prisons where there were cells, kind of like monastic cells, right? And a person would have their own little cell. And in that cell, they would be by themselves. They might have some work to do, but they might just have this time. And then supposedly what would happen, they would be reformed. And so what Jane Brox does in this book is talks so powerfully about how silence, depending on whether it's forced on you or whether you choose it, can be either this incredible tool of grace or a tool of oppression. And I found it so fascinating to think about the power of something like silence. Who is, who's got the power to make you silent? Who has the power to silence people? And then what is it when you actually have the power to say, I want to be silent. I want to not, I don't want to be forced to speak. And she does an amazing job of talking about, you know, not only the prison system, not only a lot of monastic history, um, but how um, this, this idea, this reality called silence, which is increasingly rare in our world, right? There's increasingly less silence, real silence in the world. Um, how, how do we see it in history as both this incredible gift and this incredibly kind of oppressive tool of cruelty? I mean, of course, certainly some people that were put in solitary confinement were kind of went crazy, right? Because they were put in solitary confinement and they didn't hear another noise for, for a long time. Um, but uh, anyway, so such a fascinating book, really good read. You don't feel like you're reading like a history book, you feel like you're reading a story, just a good story. So I'm gonna lift that up and it was, um, it was a book that was there at the monastery library and I found it and I thought, this is the book that I was meant to read. And I read it and finished it right before I, I, so it was just the right book to read, but it was a great way to think about silence in a kind of historical way. Um, and how anything, I mean, we know this, right? Anything can be a tool for the good or a tool for the bad, right? Depending on who, who's got it, right? Like, um, you know, like food is something that is wonderful and, and we would die without, but too much food, the wrong food, in the wrong hands can be a terrible thing, you know? Um, we can do this with anything, but she kind of lifted the silence up. So any thoughts about that? I just wanted to share a little bit about that. There are a lot of people who never have silence. Think about how we're living in the cities and so close together, and I think that you know, has all of that, it makes you more irritable. I mean, it's easy you. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think about that as silence as something that is certainly um, again the choice to be able to be silent is um, shows your class right it shows how much how much privilege you have um, because uh, because you know 
let's let's say the majority of people in the world live in um, houses where they are sharing a room not only with one other person but maybe like five right you know so you are and you might live in a house that isn't anything like uh you know south group and the next house which is like a shack is right next to it right so you're living in this incredible um world of people where you have no control over private space and you have no control over science at all um interestingly then you think about more and more like the world that we live in an incredibly privileged world how we are not giving ourselves silence, right most people are listening to something or watching something or both most of the time maybe actually every hour of the day Maybe as they're going to sleep at night, they're listening to something. Maybe as they wake up in the morning, immediately a TV or a radio or something goes on, podcast that you're listening to, easily the entire day, even if you live alone, could be surrounded with conversation, music, noise. Um, and so just that interesting thing, we have a lot of fear of silence um, as a culture even if there's also a longing that we have it, you know, because we know that silence is something that I think we do long for on, you know, on some level. There, that kind of space where we're not feeling assaulted by, by all the stuff around. Um, so, so much to think about there. What? Oh, oh that's energy. What's the connection? <laughs> To me, I don't know. I don't consider music to be other than silence. Other than silence. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is interesting. I mean, it, I've talked about this with a lot, like in worship, right? Um, there's precious little silence, even in worship, but you know, we try sometimes for a few seconds here and there, you know, for for a, a kind of sense of space. And at certain times of the year, we might try for more like a few more seconds um and you're right that might be the only silence that not just the teenagers there's left all the adults in the room everybody everybody lives in a world that is surrounded by possibility for um and so it is a question and i'm not trying to kind of be moralistic about this other i just think it's interesting like what is it what is it about silence what is our relationship with silence um, and when has silence been chosen for us and it has not been good? And when have we chosen silence and it has been very good? You know, um, I mean, there's, there could be a lot of different, and um, this is certainly a question of gender. I mean, and a, and a question of, um, again, all the different levels of privilege in the world, like who gets to speak? Who gets to speak first? Who doesn't get to? Um, so I, uh, Real complicated, but interesting stuff. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so, yeah, yeah, go. No, no in, in a particular trouble when my life, Pastor had been told me that the only way that you can get through hard times is to spend time by yourself alone. And that's a quiet time. So you really, the only time that you can figure out how to get out is to figure out who you are what you're capable of. And he was a big proponent of silence and quiet, going somewhere where there was nothing. Take books and read, but just reflect on everything around you. And it was amazing when you do that, all the stuff you thought was troublesome because now you're on your own. You have to figure this out. And when you're there, the solutions come to you. They, they just seem to come to you. I mean, it's not an easy path, but it works. When last night at our dinner table, we had oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Um, a long, long, long time ago, a relative of mine um, who was a Quaker had a Quaker funeral, mm -hmm. and they opened with a statement, and then the men sat here, and sat here, and nobody said a word for an hour and a half, and then they got up and left. <laughs> it was like, but Heidi's brother was a Quaker too in the current day, and you know, the, the silence is, is the integral 
part of that culture and community. And it's it's interesting. It's it can feel very vulnerable. I must feel very vulnerable. Sure. I'm from a Quaker background. And I don't speak at all upstairs in the Sunday morning. You know that. I know that. Yeah. Oh, you do. Not everybody does. But I'm very quiet. And it's amazing, even with music, I can tune it out. It's like, um, it's to me the ultimate peace is to come here and I get to choose what I listen to. I can choose the music, I can choose um, all of that, but I it's so spiritual to me to be completely quiet here. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's, it's who I am. Mm -hmm. And I was out skiing yesterday in the backcountry and the only, other than a few people around me, but the only noise I heard, it was perfectly quiet, it's cold, and the crunch of the snow. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's such a privilege to be able to choose silence. And I, I, you know, Trish brings up a whole other thing. What is the difference when you're keeping silence communally as, as opposed to keeping it private, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is a, certainly a deep part of the monastic tradition, that even though there was a lot of time that um, monks or sisters spent by themselves, they were also almost always part of the community as well. And part of the time that they spent in prayer was time together. Um, and how does that change the quality of the silence when you're keeping it with you, you know? Um, so just, I mean, there's so much. This is like, you know, you know, you spend your life writing or thinking or wondering about this. I find it interesting when we sent you on your way yeah. and you had that litany for me to, yeah. the only thing I had lit on it was the psalm I wanted you to remember, be still and know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that's possible. And then somebody said, hey, you can leave things alone. Oh, you know, that I don't have to be there the whole time. That I had the control over it. That initially I thought, I think my brain would talk first if I had to be in a silent retreat. But having the choice was huge. choice. But I, I hear this too. You know, I was, I, I feel like this is, you know, I come to this, I said this in the beginning, right? I'm not a naturally silent person. You know, I'm not, this isn't like, I'm not a natural contemplative, right? I'm not somebody that just goes and, but I find this kind of draw right now, this draw, this call to spend more time so that if I'm going out skiing alone, I want to make sure that I'm just going out and skiing alone and I'm not trying to listen to something else and I'm not trying to, I'm, I just want to be there. I don't know if I could, I could have done that as well 20 years ago. You know, so what is that? We all have our own life stories about what what is it that we need at certain points of time or that we want to explore? Because yeah, if you had told me I had friends that were like practicing practicing Buddhists who would go on silent retreats for days and days. And my thought was like, oh my gosh, I was like, what would I do? I wanted to talk, you know? Um, but um, it was fascinating to hear that. And you get to choose. If you've got an out, does that allow you to go in, right? Because you know there's a door in the We did one spiritual retreat on the coast of Oregon at our private church. And what part of the retreat was we spent half a day in silence, all of us. And it was interesting how many of us found that we were talking to the dog because you just had to say <laughs> <the> something. <laughs> yeah. It's it's different when you're alone, but you're right. It's awesome. That was that interesting experience I said when I talked about the, you know going to the monastery that um, in this Benedictine monastery you eat meals with other guests in silence. So you're again doing this communal activity of eating, and it's and it's silent. And I've never done that before. I you know I I never had an experience of sitting around tables with people that I kind of knew and kind of didn't. 
you know. And here we are doing this incredibly actually intimate thing, which is eating. But kind of intimate, you know, you're um because all you're hearing is people eating, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's like a choir's <laughs> okay. um, this, um, this, um, so this one does not have final title, but um, really an amazing collection, The Desert Fathers and Mothers, Truly Christian Wisdom Things, as they did in that There is a collection, a complete collection of what we have that are usually just little bits and pieces, little like phrases, maybe tiny little stories from what are known as the Desert Fathers and Mothers, the Abbas and the Abbas, who were fourth and fifth century hermits and monastic communities that developed in the desert. Um, and they, you know, this, this kind of started happening maybe in the third century. People started going off into the desert. You've probably heard some stories of, of crazy people. They went and lived up on, you know, on desert towers and like had food brought to them. Um, and, but, but even though people often went out to go by themselves, communities formed. And, um, there was a deep desire in this going out into the desert to, to know God more deeply and to strip away all that was extra, strip away all that in essential, get to be essential. Um, and so I just thought I would read just a couple of these quotations. Um, and then I just really want to encourage, this is just a small compendium, but she does a great job of annotating and talking about these phrases. So she kind of has a conversation with these, these uh, desert fathers and mothers, or you could get the big fat book of all the all the desert fathers and mothers that we have. Um, one, um, a brother came to Skeda to visit Abba Moses and asked him for a word. Give me a word. And the old man said to him, go sit in your cell and your cell will teach you everything. And then this is a little longer. A brother in Skedet committed a fault. A council was called to which Abba Moses was invited, but he refused to go to it. Then the priest sent someone to say to him, come, for everyone is waiting for you. So he got up and went. He took a leaking jug, filled it with water, and carried it with him. The others came out to meet him and said to him, what is this, father? The old man said to them, my sins run out behind me, and I do not see them. And today I am coming to judge the errors of another. And when they heard that, they said no more to the brother, but forgive him. And I'm just going to read that. Read one more. Abba Pueven said, a man may seem to be silent, but if his heart is condemning others, he is babbling ceaselessly. But there may be another who talks from morning till night, and yet he is truly silent. That is, he says nothing that is not wrong. So um, just to thank the, the beginning of so much, lots of little wisdom sayings. Um, that have been really powerful for me to read kind of over the course of time, literally. So I recommend it. Um, there were two other books that I read that were kind of not so much commentaries, but conversations by two famous authors about these desert, desert fathers and mothers, their sayings. One of them is by Rowan Williams, who is the former uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Rowan Williams is an amazing writer. Totally amazing, um, powerful person to read. And I loved the name of this book, Silence and Honey Cakes, The Wisdom mm -hmm. of the Desert. And if you remember that great story in the scriptures of um, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, and he's running from, he's like, I am done with this. 
He's just one. He's just one that's great contact with the promise of all. But he's like done. And he's got Jezebel trying to kill him. And so he runs off into the desert and he's like, I'm done. I'm ready to die. Uh, and an angel comes and gives him honey um, and says, no, this will be enough for you. And so he sleeps and is silent and eats honey cake. And then he keeps on going. Uh, so, uh, and then and then the next part of the story is he um, encounters God, not in the earthquake, not in the storm, not in, but in the sound of sheer silence. So, um, so anyway, that's this reference. Um, but um, what Rome Williams kind of talks about these desert fathers and mothers, um, and talks about how um, so much of what they were concerned with was um, looking at what gets in the way of our relationship with God and trying to get out of the way of other people's relationship with God. That, that the problem is often we try to insert ourselves in and make everything work. But maybe what we need to think about is how do we get ourselves out of the way so that God can do the work that God is going to do um, in other people's lives. Um, he has a wonderful section in this book about fleeing because a lot of the desert fathers and mothers, that's what they were doing. They were fleeing the city life, fleeing the craziness of the world, um, fleeing from um, fleeing from human company. But where were they fleeing to? They were fleeing to their self. And again and again, we get this idea of if they stayed then in their self and perhaps did some reflection, the, there's a language of weeping for their sins, then they weren't running away from they were confronting what they needed to confront. And then that, that fleeing from all of the craziness actually allowed them to be a better neighbor to other people. Um, and then the other piece of that is sometimes you keep fleeing. You keep wanting to run from one place to another. And there is this deep truth in the desert fathers and mothers that again and again, they're told to stay in one place. Once you get to a community, stay there. Don't try to run off to another community because you think it's going to be better there. Stay in this one place. Um, don't run from yourself because if you're going to run from yourself, whatever that's called, you're running away from God. You're running away from yourself. You got to stay there. You got to stay there and confront that. Um, so powerful stuff about fleeing and staying in here. Um, and so it just brought up that question for me, like. You know, what do we what do we try to flee from? What do we need to flee from? Good for us to flee from. And then where are we called to stay? Where where's our self? Where are we called to stay? Where do we need to live for a while, sit for a while? Because um you could say in a lot of ways, like God has something to say to us, or we need to be with ourselves a little bit more solidly and peacefully, but all this stuff raised up. So Ron Williams. Um, and then just another book that's also kind of a conversation with the Desert Fathers and Mothers um, by Henry Nowen, also famous, famous Henry Nowen. Um, and this is called The Way of the Heart, Connecting with God Through Prayer, Wisdom, and Silence. Um, and uh, Henry Nowen reflects on the Desert Fathers. This is kind of taken from some lectures that he gave once and it was put together in a book of essays. A um, real simple read, like you could sit down and tell you this in about an hour or two. Um, but especially he talks about the role of silence and solitude and prayer. And he talks about those things as actually leading us to deeper and more profound compassion for our neighbor. And I think that was what was so powerful to me about some, sometimes in my head, I had thought, okay, these, these uh, folks that go off into the desert, they're just focus on themselves, right? But the whole purpose of it is no, not to be focused on themselves. It's like to get past yourself so that you can truly have deeper compassion for your neighbor. Um, so really powerful stuff, some good books that I read. Any, any thoughts on that? So, 
part two, we went to Alaska this summer. And I totally invite, uh, uh, if you stay around, there's like, I would love anything that you want to say about this too. Um, so we had the opportunity to visit our friend, Ursula's godmother, Chrissy. Um, in my lap. <laughs> Many of you have had an opportunity to meet Chrissy Post because she's been here. She stayed with us for periods of time. This is the same guy. Chrissy is probably one of Jeremy's and my oldest interest friends. Um, and one of those interesting things when you do have a couple, sometimes you have a friend that is equally yours, both of yours. Like, you know, you, you have a lot of friends that maybe it's more my friend or more their friend. Um, but Chrissy is, Chrissy is both of our friends. And when Ursula was born and we were thinking about God, it did not take long for us to say, well, we have to ask Chrissy to be Ursula's godmother. And Chrissy also has one of the coolest jobs in the world. She's a wilderness ranger. She's cool. <laughs> tell, tell how cool she is. You have to speak. Yeah, she didn't see part of the uh, pack. So she, I think she goes out there for like nine to twelve. In a stretch. In a stretch. But there's like this big. They you you can. It's like this island that there's this huge island mm -hmm. in Alaska that has like. What was it? So it's maybe every they they guess maybe twelve hundred Alaskan rounders, which is um, I think it was like a every per mile, like yeah. per square mile, there's one there. Yeah. Um, but there's a family of theirs that come into the past for like so many years, and so like there's generations of like kids and stuff. And so they like have names for all of them. And um there's like new cubs every once in a while. And um, but she goes there and they, they do like research. Some of the like people do research and then they just like make sure that people can see the bears when they're not allowed. They're like it's super restrictive mm -hmm. as well. So you may have heard there's two different names for this island. Admiralty Island is the of English name for it. Um, it's there's also a, a native name for this island, um, uh, which is means like the island of the bears. Um, and there's only one village that's an indigenous Alaskan village that's on one part of the other side of the island. Um, but I, you know, there's a kind of interesting story of Pat Creek that um, there was a kind of crazy guy that was there, and he basically kind of acclimated some of these bears um, to humans so that they didn't just kill everybody. Um, and and when that when this guy ended, the the U.S. Forest Service, along with Fish and Wildlife, decided to try to take this area, make this specific little area called Pack Creek a place where people could safely come and see brown bears, um, do some study of them, but try to retain the habitat to be as, as wild as possible. So, um, like there's like this, this like bears, we get really you know, like, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I would say that though, I, I am not like a huge, I'm not a biologist, I'm not even really much of an animal person, I'm not, you know, um, but I tell you, this was, even I was kind of blown away by this experience of, um, you know, of what it means to go to Pack Creek. And part of the experience that we had was, you know, as any of you that have traveled in Alaska know, it's really hard to travel in Alaska without a valley um, because there's so many logistics in Alaska 
to get anywhere because there's no roads, especially in Southeast Alaska. <laughs> um, you have to fly somewhere. And so really Chrissy was our first world guy. Um, and <laughs> she, she set all the parameters. So there's more used to it. And having, yeah, there's a lot of rules. Um, and you know, part of what we learned when we first got there, um, we, we flew in and out of Juno, um, and we had the only way to get to Admiralty Island, um, and we were staying in a island that's about you know a 25 minute kayak ride from Admiralty Island, and on this much smaller island, just maybe like a, a couple miles by half a mile, um, is where the Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife have a kind of full-time summer camp set up that they they move out of very cool camp um, in the rainforest. And on the other end of that island is an area that if you get there, you can camp yourself. And so we were going to take a float plane into this island, and Chrissy was going to help outfit us so that when we got there, we had all the tents and we had all the stuff that we needed to. Because of course, when you're taking a float plane, you can only take so much stuff, right? You have to. A certain number of pounds they take. Um, well, of course, first we got there, and you know, rain was on the forecast for like the next week. You know, because it rains most of the time in the rainforest, um, and uh, so we had a full day of kind of waiting and seeing if we were going to be able to fly. We knew we weren't going to fly the first day, um, and then the next day there was a window. There was just a window of break in the cloud cover, and we were able to get on this crazy <laughs> float plane and um, take the, you know, just maybe 45 minutes it took to fly from Juno to this island and land on the water and then come into the beach and be left there and find, thankfully, that there were, there were kayaks there for us to take and there was some stuff there and we brought a lot of food. Um, and then we had three nights there, three nights and four days. Did you have cell service or how did you extend your we had to set it up at that at that time? So when we when we were originally booked out, because no, there was no cell service. There's no, I mean, you are out there. Now we had, you know, we had the friend who was our ranger, our ranger friend, and you know, she had radio service. But that is the only way that they can they can radio in and out that's a that's a short connection. Um, and so you get dropped and you are out there. Um, and you know, and again, the idea is three days from now, somebody's gonna come and pick you up. Maybe. Um, or maybe it's raining really hard and they can't come, you know, so it's, it's a really interesting, you're definitely out there in a way. Um, and so the best way to travel in Alaska on these islands when the rain rainforest is so crazy is, um, is to kayak. So we did some wonderful kayaking, you know, um, back and forth to Admiralty Island. We got to spend a few days uh, visiting the bears and again seeing seeing the mama bears. Um, they were the salmon were running, and so uh, the bears would come up the the streams and um, and be feeding on salmon, and we could watch them and watch the cubs play together. Uh, and it was that was pretty cool. So how is the silence? How is the silence? <laughs> no, there's maybe a little, little less silence when there's. When, when you're with your family, uh, but but there was they're trying like they obviously want people to see the bears, but if it's, it's the bears home, so then it's like that's, that's another one of them. Like, you can't like disrupt them because they're just trying to like get. What kind of communication did you see the bears having? Yeah, I think it's all the most. 
sisters who um there there's a couple different families one of them is like all named after the coffees yes so there's like mocha and joe <laughs> so <laughs> and there's chino um, but then it's another family there's there's a two, I think there's like maybe two, I think three year olds. Yeah, like two or three year olds. Two year olds, two sisters who play together. But did they talk? I mean, how did they communicate yeah. amongst themselves? I think we heard, we definitely heard them like kind of snuffling and making different, but you, you saw them a lot kind of wrestling with each other. Like it was really watching, watching kids. Play and wrestle with each other, and like they were just like little kids. They were like little kids, like, and they were like squishy, like little ones. Both of the times you went, the tide was out, and when the tide goes out, on especially if it's like that, it goes out like hundreds of yards. So like they had the bears all like had all these things to play. Okay. So they could run up and down the beach, and then up and down in the in the water. And then sometimes you get to see him catch up. I think because we were with Chrissy and we got to know some of the other rangers and the wildlife folks that were there, um, we really learned, and it's very clear that all of these bears have very individual personalities. You know, they all have personalities, they all have a kind of fit in the larger family system. Um, and there's some of them that are are just you know kind of dorky and some that are <laughs> So there's the right Oh, fish and wildlife. Fish yeah. And, so there's like, there was two fish and wildlife and two natural creatures. Yes, um, yes, yes. Yes, and so one of these will be one of these will be two people mm -hmm. out of the mm -hmm. in like, a, like one little one. Mm -hmm. And she knows all of it. She's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> can. Like it's crazy. And there's basically once you get to Pack Creek, there's kind of two areas that you're allowed to be as a human, as a human being. You know, there's one area that's out on the beach, and there's kind of a rock that you're allowed to sit on. And sometimes, you know, when we were there, we watched this family of bears, and we actually even filmed them like this mama and the babies kind of go right past us, not too far away, because that was where they walked along the beach. Um, and then there's a viewing area with a really nice telescope set up, um, and then which is out by the area where you go fishing. And again, that kind of thing of just kind of sitting and quiet, watching. Um, and this comes naturally for some people, but as somebody, it does not come naturally. For I was like kind of amazed. Um, there is also one. There, there was one little hike that you could take into the into the rainforest um to a viewing platform and we did also yeah so i i just like from the way step it out with one little tower yeah in the woods um so you have to like kind of ladder to get up to all right they're very good um, yeah, so, you know, experience of things like, like tides, this was this big rock on our beach that one of our kids is climbing on right now. Um, when the tide was high, that rock would be covered. Um, the tides are in 25 feet, which I didn't understand was 25 feet vertically. <laughs> so the, like, oh, that's what that means. <laughs> So you had to make sure, you know, in the night, nothing could let them go out for so far out. And then everything was pulled in and tides would happen like the day. And so everything is also always watching the tides. Always. Oh, I don't Mm -hmm. oh, that was so cool. I yeah. Yeah. Like, that one's like one little, you know, like square foot. Mm -hmm. That was like, like, you know, it was like five to, I don't know, five, three or five stars, like just a square foot. Wow. That's crazy. So, 
lots of really cool, and we saw some cool just little wildlife, like um, kind of mink ermine type animals running around. There was one that had, oh, that's the you should say that. Oh gosh, somebody's gonna remember this. It's that, it's that effervescent light. It's the thing oh, that, Fosterescence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so um anyway, I we we had uh we eventually then got back to Juno and you know spent a little bit of time. Um we got to see the glacier near Juno and we got to do a little bit of walking around and exploring there. Um generally in the rain, we basically wore rain here the entire time. Um and, and just very little. Not like you know, right here, a lot of rain here. It's like a whole other level of rain here. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know, we need to run some, you know, and, and, you know big boots. You gotta have big boots. Um, but, uh, but anyway, it's a uh, really special and powerful time, which uh, maybe will happen again, and maybe it won't. You know, uh, again, you know, trips like that where you think, this is it. This is, we're gonna, this is. This is now. This is what we have. And we've got to just live this right now. Um, and uh, I certainly feel like um, this is the, it was a gift mm -hmm. of the summer. So, so we ask it every time. Yeah. Did we fish? Did we fish? No. <laughs> 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 that question. You feel like, well, we have a guy in here. We have to see your pictures of people. People. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Instead of catching release, he just caught it and then <laughs> made a little fire. <laughs> That's why we don't fish. <laughs> And uh, uh, so feel free to ask, but um, there there was uh, for many ways that this summer was an incredible gift. But that was one small piece of it that wasn't so small to be powerful. So Christy was the person who, when Christy. Jeremy fell, flew directly well, to be with you, right? Yeah, and just to say, you know, that that's another piece that is totally separate, but. We had just seen Chrissy at the beginning of August. Um, Ursula had had just seen her again. You know, it had been a while since we'd seen her and spent time with her. But when um, Jeremy had his accident and I was out of commission in terms of being out the wilderness, didn't know. And Ursula was the one who was calling everybody and trying to tell them what had happened. She called Chrissy. And she was like, okay, I'm going to right now because Chrissy said well you know Ursula told her that she had grandparents that were coming and Chrissy said well who's with Jeremy and Ursula said oh and she said oh I'm gonna get on a plane in two hours and go to the lakes and I will say that um Chrissy then was with me the entire time that Jeremy was in ICU and she stayed with me in Billings and just waited to see until it was okay for me. And I, I cannot, I can only, like, I only start crying when I talk to her and talk about this because what would have been such an awful time was a really beautiful time that she was with me, you know? And I, you know what this is like when you actually have a friend who can walk through those really terrible times with you. Um, it makes all the difference in the world. And, you know, maybe that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't made this trip. You know, maybe, maybe it would have. 
but it was really helped by the fact that she was right there with us. So we'll forever be grateful to Christy and probably she'll come and visit us this winter. So we're good. Oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's stuck. Yeah. How did it stop? It's weird. It was going. Let's see what. No, it's still going. It's still going, it just. Okay. 